My guests today are Mark Lautman, who is an economic development consultant. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And Senator Michael Padilla is a Democrat from Albuquerque's South Valley. Thanks for being with us. Representative Sarah Myas Desparnes is a Republican from the North Valley. Thank you for being here. Folks, every week on this program, we are sitting here talking about some of the toughest issues facing New Mexico. We're talking about poverty, hunger, the dropout rate, unemployment, you name it. The New Mexico Jobs Council, which you all were involved with, came up with one magic answer to many of those problems, and it is jobs. So, Mark Lautman, help me connect the dots here. How does creating more jobs end up solving those problems? Well, your economy needs to grow faster than the population um, if, you, if you want all of your major institutions and your households and your businesses to have more money per person to serve than they had the year before. If you don't have that extra discretionary income, you can't improve. And you're in a situation where you have to serve more people in your household, in your business, in your school system with less money. And improving is not sustainable. So when you back into how do you grow the economy faster than the population, it really boils down, can you grow the economic base of the, the, the economy that you're in faster than the population? So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that factors off of how many people are you gonna have living here in 10 years. So you know, essentially we figured out what the escape velocity of job creation needs to be to be at full employment and growing the economy faster than the population in 10 years. And it's about 15,000 economic base jobs a year, which are jobs where- Hold the, on, let me, yeah. so the uh, escape velocity yeah. is means what we need in order to grow faster than the population is 150,000 jobs. In 10 years. In yeah. 10 years. And these are economic base jobs. Yes. What's that? An economic base job is a job where the products and services produced are sold outside the economy. So the money's being, for that job, the money's coming in from outside. And you have to have a minimum number of those to grow your service sector. And the problem in New Mexico is had for the last 10 years is that the economic base has not grown faster than the population. We've been losing jobs. And the miscalculation is almost entirely on, on the attrition side. So before you can make any progress against unemployment or pr produce jobs for population growth, any new population you're going to have, you have to create enough to offset the jobs that you lost. So Intel, we all know, has, is down from over 10,000 jobs down to under 2,000, mostly from automation. So you're losing these economic base jobs all the time. So the, the miscalculation's been over the last you know, 10 or 15 years is we're losing way more every year than we think. So you have to crank up your job creation rate. So our job creation rate's gotta be a lot higher than it's been in the past to, do, to grow the economy faster than the population. That so there rate's was, 15. There was a 2014 version of, uh, the first version of a report from this jobs council, which was created about five years ago. And, you know, they came up with some proposals that got uh, put to the legislature. Senator Padilla, what have you guys been working on over the past few years in order to accelerate this job creation? Well, based on what the report has produced, um, we have a very deep understanding now of where the pockets of unemployment exist, um, what uh, the local resources may be. Um, you know, what um, job retraining actions need to take place. And so we've created, you know, very successfully in the legislature, a couple of programs, the Job Training Incentive Program, uh, the Local Economic Development Act, uh, to turn the workforce around to meet uh, the jobs that are needed for the next, say, 10 or so years, as, as Mark mentioned. Uh, the Local Economic Development Act has also been very successful. We call it LIDA for short. Yeah, JTIP LIDA. thought I would actually, uh, you know, call it out exactly what it is. Uh, we come up with some really great stuff, you know, in the <laughs> legislature. And so uh, these two programs have been successful because they go right to the heart of um, in sending a company to either come to New Mexico or an existing company to expand from an economic base job standpoint. As, as Mark mentioned, you bring money from somewhere else into the local economy rather than simply shifting the money around that's already there. So like Facebook bringing its data center uh, to central New Mexico would be bringing money from outside that's going to create some construction jobs and some other kind of jobs there? Well, that's actually a great example because that is money that comes into our economy here in New Mexico from the other side of the world. It, you know, it, it's incredibly important that we um, um, use our uh, tax uh, dollars and, and incentive dollars that we may have available 
um, in the most effective way. And so if we can focus on economic base jobs, those will actually turn the economy around uh, rather than, again, shifting the money around that's already here in the economy. Representative Maestas Barnes, you know, we've been talking about when we're bringing new jobs in. For a long time, we kept getting these call centers. And it was like, okay, there's 200 jobs or 400 jobs, but they're just answering phones and they're, it doesn't pay very well, and, and that's a little tough. The council found that the biggest problem to creating these economic based jobs is a lack of qualified workers. We don't have enough people who are qualified to do the jobs that we want to have. What do we have to do to change that? Uh, you raise a really valid point, Gwyneth. Um, we do have a lack of a qualified workforce here in New Mexico. We saw that firsthand uh, through the Jobs Council, um, and also myself and Senator Padilla have seen that specifically with some of the job fairs that we've done in our respective districts. Um, Last year I hosted a job fair and we had over 2,000 jobs available and um, all of those jobs did not get filled. We're still compiling those numbers. Perhaps Senator Padilla has some information on some of the jobs that he's uh, been able to fill. But one of the complaints that we've continually heard from the employers is that they do not have adequate training. So we did bring in... Um, but I mean, are we talking about we don't have enough physicists or we don't have enough... What are the kind of jobs that we don't have the good workers for? Uh, all of the above. We um, received testimony from Secretary Selena Bussey as well as Secretary Barbara Dameron. And we talked about different solutions, things that they can be doing at their respective, in their respective departments to bring in um, the skill set, um, to bring in the type of training that's necessary. Um, one area in particular, you mentioned the Facebook and it being brought in by Lita. Well, that particular initiative was bringing $45 million into the local economy to build these solar farms uh, to address the needs. Um, there was a company here in Albuquerque, Affordable Solar, that's leading the charge. They had 300 jobs available. I don't think that they've actually been able to fill those jobs because there's not enough uh, individuals. People who know how to install exactly. solar stuff. Right. And so, and that's one area that uh, we have seen continued growth. And so, ensuring that e whether it's in high school or in college, that there are classes available. Also, CNM has done a great job of reaching out into the community, providing not necessarily full degrees, but specialized program for these specialized areas. So, so JTIP, um, you know, the Job Training Incentive Program, is exactly what Representative uh, Maestas Barnes is talking about. So, an affordable solar, as an example, here in Albuquerque. Um, if they can demonstrate that they're going to retrain a, a group of, of workers, we will incent that company to, to make that skill set available to that company. And so uh, JTIP is an example of a successful program that we have had so far. So you give them a tax break or a refund or what's, what's the incentive? Well, they'd have to demonstrate a percentage of their payroll was, you know, for a period of time while they were training the employee to actually do the work that, that maybe Affordable Solar or a Facebook might, you know, might require. And so at that point, they demonstrate that, those documents, and the state will actually reimburse a portion of the payroll. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's one of the most effective programs we have. There, there are two other problems. One is um, a thing we call the wage cliff effects. So our, our income support for people that are out of work is... Is, is set at a level that drops off abruptly when you get a job. And depending on how much money you bank and what, what's, you know, how many people in your household and everything. And so the, the, the benefits that you get from unemployment, from being unemployed and on public assistance, don't feather out as you make more and more money. And so what, it's scary to take a job because you're, you know, you're gonna lose what you know you've had? Well, here's what the problem is, is it at, there's a, there's a wage rate at which you're making less money than you were when you were, when you were sitting on the couch, look, you know, dialing for a, a, a job interview. So what's that, what's the number? It depends on the household, how many kids you have, how, what kind of support you're getting, and, and how much you're gonna make, and what the cost of going to that job every day is. And what's happening is, for jobs that are under 15 bucks an hour, there's a very good chance that at some point in your progress from $12 an hour to $15 an hour, that you're gonna go into a wage cliff where you're actually making less money than you were when, when you didn't have a job. And, and after, when you realize it, you quit. Right. So, the, it, so we have a lot of business uh, owners who are telling us, we have people show up, they go through the application process, we get them trained and they quit after like the second or third paycheck round when they realize that they're in this wage cliff. So how do you solve that? I mean, you, you don't necessarily, do you cut the support systems or? No, I think I what mean, you do is you just, you, you have to figure out how to feather 
the gradually reduce the public assistance so there's because it just all of a sudden one day you get a raise and you're all of a sudden you're dropped out Gentle of the program. Gentle slope instead of cliff. Right. Okay, I get and, it. And, and letting everybody know that that's what's out there so they know what to expect. So that brings me to rural areas. You know, in Albuquerque, there seems like there's a lot of opportunity for a really diverse group of jobs in Santa Fe. There are a lot of government jobs that pay um, much better than that. But in rural areas, you know, you've got the Stuckies, there's some agriculture work. Um, we are draining young people and jobs from the rural parts of the state. Did the council come up with any ways to address that? Well, one of the most critical ways is to bring um, high-speed broadband access to rural New Mexico. Uh, there are parts of New Mexico that, are, that have no service whatsoever or are at all connected to the World Wide Web. Uh, there are communities that are on dial-up. There are communities that have a little bit of broadband, you know, light, and they're literally, you know, 10 years behind the schedule or behind times. Um, so we actually passed, as a result of, of endorsements from the Jobs Council, three critical broadband bills that I had this year. One of them allows a community out in, you know, the, the, the hinterlands out there to tax themselves for a particular amount of time, much like you would for a water system, a sewer system, so it's infrastructure. So now we're going to look at broadband in New Mexico as infrastructure, because that's really what it is. And, and that pathway into that community can be funded through the locality, you know, a, a five cents a, or a sixteenth of a cent or, you know, a whatever they want to do until they build out a high-speed broadband uh, network. So, so that's one bill. Another one but is... But in a shrinking community somewhere in, you know, Hidalgo County, are they going to have enough money to do that? Well, it might take them 10 years to collect all the money that, that they need to do what they want to do. So, so that's one option. Another option or another piece of legislation really is going to bring in um, a tremendous amount of investment in broadband and high-speed internet access uh, through a lot of companies uh, that will look at New Mexico very differently than they have in the past. Uh, we, we've, we've basically taken all of the regulations related to small, medium, and large telecommunications uh, carriers, and we've, we've refocused that to basically one carrier, one, one set of recommendations for the, or uh, regulations for the state. Uh, whereas today, you had to jump through 64, you know, hoops in order to, you know, to, to set up a, a really successful telecom company or, or a broadband service. So that's the second piece of legislation. The third is everyone around this table, every time you, you, pay, you pay your monthly uh, telephone bill, whether it's a landline, a cell line, or whatever, uh, we have something called the Universal Service Fund. These we fees, all, these fees on my bill, this is what right. you're talking about. <laughs> well, well we, we all pay into that, into that fund. It's actually a very worthwhile fund. Unfortunately, we come to find out that the fund is being invested in a dying technology, what we call POTS lines, the plain old telephone service. Huh. Yeah, and so today, um, if we really want to use that money effectively. It resets the, the focus of that money. It gives the Public Regulation Commission here in New Mexico, we have a regulatory body that oversees that. We give them the opportunity to, um, to go to a percentage uh, that they will uh, collect. And then we have a ceiling so it doesn't get out of control. You know, I want everybody to think we're going to just collect and collect. And it has a ceiling of $30 million. A minimum of that $30 million will be for projects that are only related to, uh, to broadband so I'm uh, hearing projects. you say some of those annoying fees that are on my cell phone bill are actually going to go to improve broadband service in the state. Well, that's right. And, and placing the money in, in, a, um, in a project that actually is about the future and bringing uh, you know, monies to those rural communities on top of the infrastructure investment, on top of the investment by a company, and then now through the, broad, the Universal Service Fund. Representative Maestas Barnes, uh, one big obstacle that the council identified in terms of job creation is taxes and regulation. What do we need to do to change that environment? Briefly, <laughs> what do we need to do to change that environment to make New Mexico more attractive? Well, what we need to do is we need to take a comprehensive approach and look at everything, every tax incentive, every tax that's on the books, and look at what's working, look at what's not working. There are a number of tax credits that are currently in place that are not being utilized or they're potentially being abused. So we need to get rid of those. And those that are actually working, we need to uh, continue. And one of those- We've um, been talking about this for years and none we, of those ever seem to go away. We have, and there was a, a big push this past legislative session where we were looking at eliminating some taxes um, and creating new ones and removing some incentives. And so that is something that we, um, it's on the, on the front burner right now. I, I can see that being a big issue in the next legislative session. But we also need to really look at those that are truly creating jobs. And we talked about the solar industry earlier, and that is one area that we've seen proven job growth. Uh, back in 
2016, there was a, a report that was put out. There were 2,900 jobs that were attributable to the solar industry in New Mexico. That was up by, from 1,000 jobs. That was the last year that the solar tax credit was in place in our state. And we're not talking about low paying, minimum wage type jobs. We're talking about jobs that start out at $20 an hour, go up to $35 an and hour. And that solar tax credit, I looked at this recently for my own house, expired. It expired right. at the end of 2016. And so we've tried over the last three years to expand it. Um, it's something that we are investing in. It does cost the state some money, but when you see the return that we're getting on our investment, it's tremendous. We'll and see you pushing for that next uh, session. I, I, I have been working on it the last three and, years. And representative, we, I want to give kudos to the representative. She really has pulled together, done a great job of pulling a bipartisan effort to get this done with Senator Mimi Stewart and a few others. And so I think uh, we should give her kudos for that. Uh, you know, on the taxes, if I could just say very briefly, uh, an idea that, uh, that I'm going to be bringing forward is basically uh, stack ranking every single incentive, credit, deduction, everything that we do as an incentive to, to bring business to New Mexico or to expand. Create an index. You know, how much did we invest in that, in that incentive, credit, deduction? How many jobs did it create? Uh, what was the average hourly wage? How long did it last? After that, you need to create a bill that forces people to read it. Well, there you go. <laughs> and, and what Let we'll do is we'll stack rank these, these incentives, credits, deductions, and, you know, if they're not doing what we need them to do, cut off the bottom half or, or 10 of them every year and put them in the programs that are working. We have just about 30 seconds left. And, Mark, I want to finish with you and ask you this question. When we're thinking about young people, and this is the environment that they're looking at when they're coming out of college and they're trying to get a job and they maybe don't have quite all of the training that they need and maybe they live in a rural area, what do we need to do to keep talented young people here and bring them home if they've already uh, gone out into the world? Well, I, you know, I think the, the most important thing for young people, and young people to me is anybody under 55, but, well, that's but uh, <laughs> that's no, is, is, is you, 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 you want the community that's, that's, uh, uh, that you want to be the home to these young people to have a plan and have some sort of articulation and, and something explicit about where they're trying to take the economy so they know that there's a role for them in the, in, in the local economy. The rest of the d decisions, or you know, if you, everybody's mix of motivations for why they would want to leave or why they might want to stay there or why if they're not here they might come, want to come back. Um, but if they know different. there's a plan and the ball is in motion and it's going to happen, then they're more likely to right. believe. But then you can be strategic about who, what kind of, of, of people are we trying to attract and hold. And it's hard to, it's hard to get explicit about that when you don't know what your economy is going to look like. And you know, once you make that decision, it's pretty easy to start dissecting what what are the push-pull factors of the people? You start focus grouping people. Why did you leave? If, you, if somebody that you wanted to stay left, you could, after a, a, a couple of uh, months, you can go interview them and find out what actually pushed them away. And is there anything in that list of things that made them leave or caused them to leave that we could fix in the next five years? Some of them, you, some things you can't fix. Your kids want to go off and experience the world, and they want to they they go off and there's nothing you can do. Other things we can fix. And what is it, what's the psychographic of, of the person you want to attract to your community? And what things do you have to put in place in the next 10 years to attract them and hold them and grow them? Thank you very much for being with us today and talking about jobs.